Hi, everybody, and welcome to another video episode of the Psych Files podcast, the podcast that tries to show you how all that stuff you're learning or learned in psychology is actually useful. So today, we're going to take a look at educational games. Now, in the last episode, I talked with uh, Dr. Eugene Geist about making learning fun again. And we talked about uh, methods of inquiry, constructivism, things like that, how to get students really interested in fun, how you, the student, could actually really enjoy uh, learning like you did when you were younger. So speaking of when you were younger, the episode made me think about uh, some notes I had put together, I had put together about uh, educational games. Now, a while back, I attended a very interesting conference called the Serious Games Summit. Yes, Serious Games Summit. And uh, as a matter of fact, it's coming up again. I won't be attending, but it's coming up again, and I think I've got the date at the end of this presentation. So I want to just kind of uh, talk to you about educational games, why uh, you know I'm a big fan. And you probably wouldn't be surprised that I'm a big fan of educational games. So uh, I put together this presentation, which I want to kind of uh, go through with you. This is a new program, very fun program called Prezi, P-R-E-Z-I, and uh, you'll probably yeah, you'll see it in the bottom left corner of the screen there, Prezi.com. Um, I'm just trying it out, and um, it's very, very different. It's a different kind of way to present uh, ideas. And so, if again, if you're tired of PowerPoint, and you want to try something new. Here's yet another program that's out there. And, um, you know, give it a shot. I will put a link to this presentation in the show notes for this episode so that you can uh, kind of walk through this and see how this was put together. And then try it out. You want to try something new. All right. So uh, let's get into educational games or games and learning. So I put together some of my thoughts. I've read a couple of books on this. I've got some references as well at the end of the presentation. What makes for a really good game? Why is it? that they are so engaging. All right? Here are some reasons here. Uh, really good games have win states. Okay? So a win state is, okay, you have won. And that gives uh, participants a feeling of accomplishment. They, really good games, employ conflict, competition, or challenge to get our adrenaline going. Right? Conflict has a, a good ability to do that. Really good games use dramatic problems, use otherworldly stories and characters to stir the, also to get you in, involved, stir the emotions, right? This is, you might be thinking of some of the games that you've played, and they take place on other planets, in other worlds, out in space, that kind of thing. Uh, they do require problem solving. Strategy games, puzzle games, are also very, very popular, and they do. It's more than just shoot 'em up, and there's plenty of shoot 'em up games, but a lot of really, uh, you know, games like The Sims is very popular. Uh, a lot of really good games do require problem solving. Other features of really good games they encourage interaction among the participants in order to solve some of those problems. They are unpredictable. That's one of the key things that keeps us in there then. Uh, the behaviorists might refer to that as being a variable ratio schedule reinforcement, which means you never know when something is going to work, when it's going to work out for you. So that's an important uh, uh, one of the keys to a really good game. And they provide a sense of urgency, right? So something has to be solved or else somebody's going to die, which sounds like a lot of movie plots. Other uh, aspects of games, they have rules, right, in order to give play structure and help to put us in the game. You can do this, but you can't do that. You can't go over there. You can't do this. You can only shoot so many bullets, and then you have to do something else to get more, right? So you have to figure out all the rules and the limitations within the games. They have goals to provide motivation and let us measure ourselves against some standard so we know how other people did. You get to put your name in if you're a high scorer, that kind of thing. Uh, they're interactive. We're always doing something. We're always required to do something. We always have to do something in order to reach the goal. And there's usually no sitting back, except for certain little cut scenes where you can watch. Uh, good games are situated in an, inter in an interesting place or time. Right? So they, maybe they take place in the future, take place in the past. They have outcomes and immediate feedback from which we can learn about how we did and then adjust 
what we do in the future based upon what we got from that feedback. Really good games adapt their difficulty, and this is one of the keys. They adapt their difficulty to our skills uh, to keep us in this state of flow, which if you're studying psychology, you have probably heard, hopefully heard about flow. This is any experience. It doesn't have to be a game, although it does tend to happen a lot in games. Anything that you do in which you are kept at that sort of maximum level of arousal that's comfortable for you. So you, uh, you have to do, you're, you're working against a, an opponent who is about matched as, as you are to your skills. So if you're playing, this is, by the way, is, is um, famous book by Mikhail uh, Csikszentmihalyi, which I think I pronounced correctly. Uh, I wrote a book called Flow, so I'll have a link to that from the website. Uh, the idea is if you're playing a game, let's say, like tennis, you uh, probably don't want to play against someone who's really, really good because they'll beat you. And you don't want to play against someone who's really poor because that's not really, you know, you know that's not a, a game. You want to play against someone who's about matched at your skills. Right? That's an, one, another key to why and, – and games can do that. They can adjust their difficulty based upon where you're at. I mean, most of them start out easy, right, and then move up. If they get too hard, too fast, that turns gamers off. And so part of the artificial intelligence in games is to, uh, to be able to detect what you're capable of doing and how well you're doing and then adjust uh, the challenges so that you're not overly challenged or under-challenged. So as I went through those, that's all of my keys there of, of good games. You probably did detect that, by golly, there's a lot of actual uh, sharing going on between good games and really good teaching. So what do really good teachers do? Well, they have goals, right? All lessons, plans have goals, uh, more often called objectives. So there is somewhere you want to go. There's somewhere, something you know you, as a student, you know you have to learn something. As a teacher, you have a particular goal for the class. You want students to learn something. So there are goals. Games have goals. Really good teaching draws on what I've referred to in a previous episode as motivation to learn strategies. Now, I did an episode a while back, a link to that again from the show notes, called uh, Intrinsic, Intrinsic, Extrinsic, and the Motivation to Learn. And uh, I highly uh, recommend that. Yeah, I learned a lot from that episode about these different strategies, and the least of which maybe you hear about is the motivation to learn. But this is the idea that we, we are drawn into learning experiences when they include things like mystery or puzzles or what appears to be conflicts. We don't like, and this even goes back to Eugene Geist, uh, his interview on Piaget. We need to find, to, to either assimilate or accommodate uh, unusual, unpredictable experiences. And so th this is why the, the motivation to learn strategies, really good teachers do that. They start out the class, the day, and maybe pepper throughout questions, puzzles. Why is this happening? How can we solve this? Um, gee, this seems to be true, but that seems to be true. How do we do that? And students are pulled in, no matter what they're learning, they can be pulled in when they, when they are hear about something that just doesn't quite make sense. All right? And games do that too. They have mystery. They have puzzles. Good teachers help students draw on prior knowledge. So what do you already know that could be used in this new situation? Uh, good teachers help students formulate questions. Uh, good teachers encourage students to use metacognitive strategies, which is, in other words, do I understand what I just read, for example, in reading? We talk about metacognition a lot. Do I really get it? And in fact, when, when students learn about, when you learn, if you're a student, uh, about how to effectively learn from a textbook or any book, one of the things that you're encouraged to do is to stop and to ask yourself a question. Do I understand what I just heard or read. And that's an important skill to learn because a lot of students can read and even underline, right? You can do that. And then you're done and you don't really, you know, it's like, okay, I read it. Well, that's part of the deal. But did you actively read it? Did you ask yourself, anyway, I'm not sure I get that. Did you try to think about it yourself? Okay, so in other words, did you put it in your own words? Did you put it up here, personalize it for yourself? 
That's metacognition. Big term, really not a very complicated idea, but a very important one. All right, so did I understand what I just heard or read? Good teachers provide students with appropriate challenge to optimize the potential for, again, flow. All right, we are presenting you with content that is as difficult as you are about able to learn right now. And that may, some of you who have learned about uh, scaffolding, that's uh, from Vygotsky, may be familiar with that idea, that you want to help students just at that point, they're just about ready to learn something, right? That's a really good point to be at, because you're right about it, the aha experience, right? So there's another point. And I think my last one here is that uh, good, uh, good teaching, uh, teachers provide con a context for the material, and that's called anchored instruction. Help knowing, uh, helping students learn uh, when and in what situations they'll be using what they are learning. Let me give you some examples of what I think are some uh, simple ways to use the gaming ideas, notions of conflict and goals and feedback uh, uh, that, are, that do both pull people in and, of course, have them learn a specific body of content. Now, start from some of the simpler ones. Many students, including myself, I mean many teachers, uh, when I was uh, teaching actively, uh, used uh, strategies like uh, hangman, flashcards, Jeopardy, right? But I, uh, they're not bad. They can be fun. And if you're learning specific facts, these are probably the ways to do that. But um, this is not what's meant by educational games necessarily. We've gone far beyond that. But let's just go to that um, good old Jeopardy. And I have a link to this uh, from the website. This is, uh, there is a template out there uh, that's free for anyone to use, and very easy to use. A, a, it's a PowerPoint template. So this, what you're looking at, is actually in PowerPoint. And it's very simple to set up. You put in your terms, and uh, the, the Jeopardy game is built for you pretty darn quickly. So this is, it's fun, but again, it's, um, not you know there's, there there aren't there's not a lot not a lot of unpredictability you can't really explore here this could be done individually so it's good for certain purposes uh, but not terribly engaging not what you would call what we'll see later good old flashcards right which now as you can see here's one that uh, is animated and what's fun uh, and good about these flashcards that are online now and. Uh, uh, in fact, I've seen a, a number of really good sites that help you to build flashcards online, and you can stick them right into a, an online class. Or, if you're a student, build your own flashcards and then test yourself. So, another thing I'll have to remember to link to from the website. But what's cool about this, as you can see what's going on here, is that once you know the definition, and you know that you know it, you've flipped over the card and you go, okay, I was right. Then you can move it over into sort of a, I know this bank, you know. And then you're not presented with that term again. So there's some good, good uh, uses of technology, applications of it, to the time-tested and honored game of uh, flashcards. Finally, here's a version of Hangman, and I just you get a letter right and you get an applause. You get the whole word. Oh, I didn't get it. And this is sort of an alien um, hangman. Nobody's hanged. An alien gets, uh, gets beamed away to this planet. All right, so what you're trying to do is get the alien to be completed. And I think this one's actually teaching Spanish words. Uh, so, uh, you know, a little less violent than hangman is the, uh, you know, the, forget what they call this, uh, don't let the alien get beamed away game. All right, kind of fun, but now let's get into some of the ones that are a bit more challenging and what I call these now we're talking games. More challenging includes some simulation elements as well. Now one company, and this was one of the companies uh, people I talked to at the Serious Games Summit when I went there, is, uh, it's called GoVenture, GoVenture.net, and they specialize in some of these simulation games. So here is one. More realistic and feel as though you're actually living the experience. For now, let's go right into our business itself. This is a conceptual view of our business. In a moment, we'll see little footsteps, which represent This is a demo that's our customers. on their website. The more footsteps we see, the more customers we have at that time. 
customers are ordering from my menu. In this case, I'm running a restaurant, so I have a hamburger and soup and french fries and salad. These are the prices I've set for my products and how many I've sold for the day. I'm the only one working at the moment. And the weather, which currently is cloudy and warm, the weather does affect the buying habits of our customers. Go into my products area, look at any one of my products simply by click clicking on it, and changing the price of that product at any time to see how that affects my sales and my profitability. I can also so what you see there is that the, they're learning about business skills. Uh, math is also in there by running a hypothetical uh, restaurant. Kind of an interesting idea. And so uh, another one is just called Lemonade Stand. If you, that one is, uh, if business skills is not your goal. There are three main decisions we need to make when running our Lemonade Stand. But first, let's take a look at the weather forecast. It's not always accurate, but it's important to know what's coming up for today, which we can see is forecast is as warm and rainy. People prefer to buy lemonade on hot, sunny days. The first decision we need to make is to set the price of our lemonade. We can set it anywhere from $0.25 cents to $3. Let's try $1.60, given that it's going to be kind of rainy out today. Next, we must set our recipe. Anywhere from sour and watery, which is not very tasty, to sweet and lemony, which is the favorite. However, sweet and lemony also means more lemons and more sugar. It means more expensive to make. So let's go somewhere. In so as you can see, that's kind of neat. Um, and, and obviously tailored toward a, a younger audience there. But even there, there's an opportunity to learn math and a little bit of business skills. And you're, you're using the idea of a lemonade stand, which probably every kid has done the old lemonade stand thing. All right, let's move up a bit in complexity here. Here are some games that give the uh, people a uh, even greater ability to explore. You may have heard this was popular a couple of years ago, and it was called Tactical Iraqi. And now they've expanded their suite of products, this company, and you will find them at tactical-language.com. And what they do is they've used what's called the, the Unreal Engine, which is uh, the the uh, really the architecture, the programming that is used to uh, run more popular kinds of shoot 'em up, drive around games, uh, to run simulations. That and this was used uh, to train uh, soldiers in Iraq. Let's just see if we have a little bit of that. By wearing his sunglasses. Finally, we'll play the mission game. It simulates real-life tasks and missions by having you communicate with computer-generated characters. Your mission is to find a local leader and negotiate a reconstruction project. The game is not scripted. The dialogue evolves based on what you say and do. If you develop rapport with the Iraqis, they cooperate with you. If you are rude, they will be hostile. The red square shows when the system is listening to you speak. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Green. So what you see there is that you can you're you're walking down the street. You can interact with the characters based upon what you say. They say things. There are outcomes to them. What a fascinating way to learn language. And as I say, they've, they've really expanded out. There are other languages that they have available now. But uh, I think that's just a, a great way to go with all of the incredible power of these uh, game engines. So uh, that, you'll see more and more of that in the language space. So some immersive games that include urgency and mystery. Another fascinating company. Um, to really take a look at them, they're called Future Labs. Or just Future Lab, I think. It's www.futurelab.org.uk. And here's one of their uh, products. This is really neat. Space Mission Ice Moon. Space Mission Ice Moon is a simulated mission run over video conferencing so that students in a classroom anywhere in the country can link up to the space center and try to save four astronauts that we've trapped underneath the ice on Europa. Yes! Agent needs help! And they get all kinds of information coming back to them, so things like heart rate, blood pressure, the battery levels, oxygen remaining. There's a lot of teamwork involved, a lot of running around. It's very exciting. It's a lot of fun. 
The mission's only 90 minutes, and in that time, they've got to save these four lives. Oh no, are we close by? How long have we got? The commander back at the space center is constantly nagging them, constantly demanding more answers. And just towards the end, the pressure is really ramped up, so the kids are getting very excited, very involved in it. The different teams are in different places around the room where they're getting their information. But the idea is there's a lot of movement within the room. The students are all running around, telling each other what they need to know, but they're all on task. And so that's, uh, again, that's a space mission. Ice Moon. What a, what a cool way to get students actively involved. There's urgency there. There's hypothetical astronauts who are going to die. They run out of oxygen. How are we going to save them? And so a lot of science and math skills are brought together to uh, you know, try to save the, the uh, astronauts on the, on the moon. Okay, my last example, another great company, Muzzy Lane, unusual name, but they, um, their most popular product was a, uh, called Making History. And this allows uh, students to learn about history and take different sides in, in, in combat. And not to, it's not just to shoot them up. It's, it's about learning about geography and actual history and uh, people and places. Um, this is really quite a neat, uh, neat company as well, doing some wonderful things in educational gaming. All right, so just a, a couple of things. Oh, there's the Serious Games Summit. Uh, logo and the URL is a little bit uh, hard to remember. Uh, www.gdsconf, in other words, game development, game developers conference is what it is. So too hard to remember. I have it on the website. It's coming up in late March. I just want to respond to a couple of key critics against the idea of using games. Someone might say, yes, but the situation, the context, or the story, it's taking place on the moon, it's, it's so unrealistic. Okay. It is unrealistic. In some cases, of course, it is unrealistic. But let's try to remember a couple of things. One is that the, the, the goals of any experience, any learning, be it in the classroom or anywhere else, are to understand, of course, and to be able to apply. So my response would be, if a game accomplishes these goals, if students learn from it and can apply their knowledge, then who cares if the situation is unrealistic? Students know the situation is unrealistic, and we can certainly add in a component that gives them an understanding of the real-world nature of the task after they've played a somewhat you know, exaggerated game. Pull students in. Uh, second critic might say that using games is giving in. Right? It's giving in to our, uh, our, what do you call, what do we say about students today, young people today, they don't have any attention spans, our low attention span students. Why can't students just learn the way I learned? And, and the first thing I'd say about that is again to go back to the episode on uh, constructivism, on uh, why can't learning be fun. Putting students into rows and teaching them all the same thing. Uh, let's not forget that there are, there are reasons why that this, our current approach to teaching and learning exist. And just because that's the way we learn doesn't mean it's necessarily the best way to learn. The world has changed. And one reason you might want to look at games is just because, look, it's, it's just a different world. You know, we, we can't expect students to be the same way that we imagine we were when we were younger. No doubt we were perfect students when we were younger. Uh, why shouldn't learning be fun is also something I would say. It starts out that way. We talked about that in the previous episode as well. So it starts out fun. Why can't it remain fun? Uh, ultimately, I'd also say this. People learn best when they work on activities that are tied to achieving their personal goals. In other words, when you really need something, right? when there's something urgent in your life, if the, the plumbing broke, uh, if you, or, or your bicycle broke, or your car broke, you probably, you know, although today we, we might call in an expert, but depending upon the difficulty, you probably have to learn something. And you are up for learning that. You're into learning it because it solves a pressing and personal problem. We, in, in you know, we are talking mostly to teachers, I guess, we can't give students personal problems. You know, we, we can't give them uh, challenges to solve that are really pressing. But we can give them games which really pull them in 
And um, well, so I think that's it's a good way to use games to bring that sense of urgency to really get them to want to solve something. And maybe someone, an astronaut who's running out of air on the moon, who cares, right? But let's acknowledge that we often learn because it's something that's very personal to us. So finally, a bunch of references up uh, here. They are. Oh my gosh, all kinds of interesting books. Mark Prensky, uh, P-R-E-N-S-K-Y, has written quite a number of books. Um, and I'll have all of these uh, on the uh, website as well. So I hope you have enjoyed this episode, this video episode. Uh, there goes my cat of the Psych Files. Okay, thanks a lot, and uh, see you next time. Appreciate it. Bye now.